Good morning. My name is Maurice Crespi. I'm the managing partner of Schindler's Attorneys. Schindler's Attorneys is a co-founder of Cobra, together with IQ Business and Engaged Business Turnaround. We now have uh, in excess of 40 partners who've joined Cobra on a pro bono basis. The idea of Cobra is that the partners uh, 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 come together and contribute to uh, in any way possible in assisting businesses. And when we say contribute, uh, contribute in all disciplines, from law to accounts to turnaround um, and aspects such as today's webinar, uh, where we'll be dealing with uh, agility, uh, business agility during COVID-19. Now, this is a prime example of the skill set that are available to uh, 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 companies out there. Cobra's pro bono offering includes consulting at this level. Um, we are assisting businesses for, at a spaza shop level all the way up to businesses with excess, uh, in excess of 500 employees. And uh, this will give you some insight into uh, the type of process, the type of assistance that uh, uh, can and will be given by Cobra. So today we have um, uh, Bies de Gregorio, who uh, is from IQ Business. He is a specialist in business agility, and uh, we'll be dealing with what is agile and business agility, an introduction to the core pillars of business agility, the practical tips to apply from personal and team perspective, and uh, the core values that will be applied uh, in assisting businesses during this crisis. Um, just a bit about uh, Biaz. Biaz is a managing partner at IQ Business. He began his career at the company as a developer in 2000, but quickly became involved in project and program management as well as software and technology um, uh, enablement. Together with his team, uh, Biaz has now trained close to 5,000 people on Agile and has been involved in some large trans transformations in various industries with a core focus on banking and finance. He has a professional expertise and interests include project management, uh, software development, agile approaches, and uh, the list is endless, so I'm not going to be reading it. Uh, he uh, he's, has, again, a whole host of qualifications that uh, I won't burden you with, um, but super, super impressive. Um, so I'm going to be handing over to Biaz to take us through those topics. Um, thank you, thank you very much for joining. Um, thank you to my panelists. Uh, today, uh, we also have Warren Castle from Engage Business Turnaround. We have Emma Marseille from IQ Business. We have Gary uh, from uh, Schindler's Attorneys. And we have uh, Bob from IQ Business. The idea today is that it's a Q&A, so please at any point post your questions so we can um, have them addressed uh, by the panel, but in particular, please direct uh, uh, any questions you may have to Biaz and uh, we'll deal with them. That's the idea behind webinars, otherwise we could just pre-record these and uh, post them. I'd also like to welcome our Facebook guests and our YouTube guests. So over to you, Biaz. Thanks, Maurice. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Let's hope that uh, people can see it. Cool. And I'm assuming people can see that now, huh? Um, yes, yes, so it's, a, it's, a, it's one of those things about we're remotely in lockdown. Uh, normally, we do these uh, conversations uh, in person. And uh, you feed off the energy of the people in the room. So we're going to be feeding off the energy of a 2D picture. Um, hopefully, hopefully, we'll get off that. Um, so thanks, Maurice, for the introduction. Um, yeah. Uh, been involved in Agile since 2010, uh, really around trying to help IQ Business First adopt Agile ways of working. But over the period of time, a lot of our customers are like, oh, that's pretty cool. Please, can you help us? And we've developed a team of about 28 Agile consultants that we do training, coaching, and consulting work. And we'll talk about it maybe a little bit around how um, it's impacted us. Um, and under no means, I'm not, a, I'm not a COVID expert, I'm not an economics expert, I'm not a legal expert, um, but I have a, a passion for agile and business agility. 
Um, and hopefully I'll be sharing some of the uh, approaches and principles and some ideas and tips that you can apply um, from a personal point of view as well as from an organizational point of view. Um, so, um, yeah, let's leave the questions, I guess, to the end and we'll, we'll try and address as many of them. I can see on the, on the, uh, the attendees, uh, some of my, uh, I see Stevens on there, a couple of people that I know. So, um, hopefully, now this stuff is uh, uh, too new to you, but we'll, we'll share some of our experience and knowledge. Um, so, so uh, let's get straight to it. Um, I always, I guess, we, we start off with quotes because if we do, if we do talks, we, we speak about um, other people's quotes and we often get accredited, people are accredited with the wrong thing. So I don't know if Charles Darwin actually said this, um, but I think it's relevant to what we're speaking about. It's really around, it's not the, the strongest of the species that survives, but uh, nor the most intelligent, but it's really about the ones that are most adaptable to change. I think it's quite relevant in what we're trying to deal with at the moment. Um, I think in, in agile software development, where it comes from, we've been trying to adopt this way as a working in, in order to improve the speed of delivery, specifically in the IT teams. Uh, as things want to scale, you know, we deal with you know, primarily financial services. Um, we've, we maybe haven't met the goal of what agile is, is there for. Um, and there are many reasons. I mean, we've, we've conducted uh, the state of agile survey for the last few years. Um, and I think one of the things is that we've really focused on one area, which is the software development teams, but we have challenges both upstream and downstream. So when the requirement comes in or where the concept to cash kind of conversation goes, um, and they are still traditional in the thinking. Um, and uh, whilst we have made progress in the one area, we've been slow in, in adopting this change in, in the other areas. And my talk today is really about providing some context as to what visibility is, um, and how organizations can adopt this principle in the way we do things. Uh, so what is business agility? And maybe kind of the definition of business agility, and there's many out there, um, is really the ability to respond to change. I mean, there's lots of change that's happening at the moment, um, lots of uncertainty, you know, customers, changes in customers' markets, uh, new technology. But the real challenge is about how do we actually embrace change um, and allow change to give us the competitive advantage and to deliver new value to new and existing customers. Traditionally, we are quite reactive to change and, uh, and we, we respond to change, but how do we actually make it as part of what we do? Um, and there's a reason why there's a, and, and some people have, may have attended some of my talks previously and often use this story, but there's a, there's a reason why there's an impala and a, and a cheetah in the picture. And it, it's a story about a boy and his dad, they're walking in the bush, um, and in the distance, they spot a cheetah stalking an impala. Um, and the boy and the, and the son, they stop and, they, and the, the father says to the, to the son, he says, I bet you anything that the impala will get away. Um, and the boy obviously didn't believe it, his dad and obviously took the bet. Um, and in a few frantic seconds, lots of dust everywhere, uh, the impala actually did escape. And obviously the boy was like, oh, wow, how did that happen? Uh, he turned to his dad and said, how, dad, how did you know that? So he said, well, ton, the son has two real reasons. Um, the first one is that both animals are agile and fast in the way they do things. But the cheetah doesn't have the stamina. So it doesn't, can't run for, for a long period of time. So it doesn't have the resilience. And secondly, probably the most important is they have different motivators. Uh, the cheetah has, is motivated by the next meal, whereas the impala is really motivated by survival. And I think this is part of the reason why I think in the way we've adopted Agile in our, in our clients haven't necessarily achieved the total promise of Agile. Um, it's because whilst people and organizations and leaders believe that there's a need to change the way they do things, I don't necessarily believe there has been that urgency. And I think what has happened now is we do. So urgency is, is really around the opposite of complacency. And complacency in, in organizations is where, you know, employees are happy with the status quo. You know, they, they say, this is, this is how it's always worked over here. You know, we don't need to change things. Um, why do we need to change? And I think that's the challenge that we have. But right now, we actually do have. We have an urgency for change. The current global crisis is a real burning platform for me. And I'm actually quite excited about what I've been trying to achieve and actually using this as an opportunity to do that. Um, and we had to, I guess, live um, by what we practice, what we preach, right? So in our, in our team, um, as we said, we do a lot of coaching and training, which requires a lot of face-to-face -face interaction. Um, it requires in-classroom training. It requires workshops, facilitation. Um, as lockdown happened, um, guess what? Um, a lot of that stopped. So transformation projects were put on hold. Um, training was put on hold. 
Um, and we had to look back and say, well, actually, is our, is our business model resilient? Um, so we, we took a step back and had, had to look at prioritizing what we had to focus on. A lot of our senior people were on the bench in, our, in a consulting speak that means not working at clients or not billing. Um, so we had a challenge, um, but we, we prioritized and we focused and we created an opportunity of like actually doing what we tell our clients to do. And within two weeks, our training, 11 courses, were, were able from, from a remote point of view. And that's not just like actually uh, using Zoom for remote training. Um, it requires quite a significant amount of effort. And we also adapted our coaching, realizing that in the professional services space, a lot of people were going into remote ways of working and they needed help in that aspect. So as much as Agile was important, it was also important as and what we're trying to achieve is obviously um, in, continue, maintain productivity, ensure that we keep continue with the engagement or employee engagement and deliver value to the customers. So we helped, we actually come up with a new value proposition called a digital ways of working, uh, where we help teams, individuals and organizations adopt remote working. Um, we all managed to get to somewhere or another, but how do we make it sustainable? And there's a little joke, I think, uh, that, that's made around, it's like who accelerated your digital transformation? And uh, it's a CEO, CTO of COVID-19, and it looks like COVID-19 did that. I know it's humorous, uh, but it's also quite true. I mean, I was talking to my uh, neighbor who works for a large corporate, uh, a bank, and he's saying within a week, they managed to move their teams into remote work. They managed to introduce changes into production environment by ensuring that they made rapid decisions by removing the red tape and bureaucracy that has infiltrated organizations over the last few years so you know kind of kind of a little bit bittersweet because it's like you know we've we've been talking to our customers around removing these wasteful processes and governance and i'm not saying governance is not important it obviously is specifically in a, in a highly regulated environment but um, it's also created waste in the system and unnecessary processes which actually is which impedes the ability to be agile um, so that's the kind of the thinking around it around the urgency I don't, I don't want to bore people with kind of what is agile because um, uh, it's a little bit of uh, probably not that exciting, but uh, I just do want to share a little bit of the history um, just to give you context and uh, talk about uh, how we apply that and what are the challenges are from, from that point of view. And, and if you talk about the evolution of management in general, so management of delivery operations, et cetera, it's obviously gone through different phases. Um, and I'll often use a slide just to give a little bit of context. And we started in 1776 with Adam Smith in the Wealth of Nations who wrote the book. Um, and he was looking about creating efficiency in a pin factory. And uh, um, the, the, basically what he did was introduce specialization. Um, so everybody had a specific role because he felt that it was the most efficient. But actually that was the, the first real organizational structure um, based on silos. Um, so if you think about one of the challenges around creating an agile organization is we've introduced silos into the system um, and we'll talk about why silos are, are a challenge. You fast forward a few uh, several years into the early 1900s and we had scientific management. Again, F.W. Taylor or Taylorism um, was talking about, how, again, efficiency, but the, the scientific approach to management. Things like measuring everything. It was in an iron factory, I believe, and he was sort of saying, like, how much coal actually can be fit on a shovel? The size of the shovel will determine how much coal an individual can put into the furnace, um, the distance between workstations. But what he also introduced was the delineation between those that were educated and those that were uneducated, um, or the laborers. Um, we call this kind of management style and introduced the kind of uh, command and control, dictatorial ways of working, around instructions, um, which I guess maybe permeates. We move into the 60s, we talk about automation um, and, and kind of motivational theories. But really we are in the fourth industrial revolution, everybody knows it, I'm not gonna bore it, but actually I attended a talk, I, I can't remember the gentleman's name, um, but he was saying the fourth industrial revolution isn't the introduction of the technology like AI, machine learning, etc., but it's actually more about how we apply it, the application of it to solve complex problems. Things like self-driving or the internet of things with the kind of tele, tele, tele presence for doctors, et cetera. And we are entering what we call the age of software. Um, so we, there's um, a Mark and Dreesen in 2011 says, software is eating the world. And there's a thing that says, there's more lines of code in a Toyota Hilux Bucky 
than there is in the whole of Facebook. So we're entering this kind of knowledge age, age of agile. But the problem that we have is that um, organizations realize they need to transform, but they are still using the managerial frameworks from previous revolutions or, or uh, management processes. Um, and that's part of the challenge around why we think uh, we need to adopt an agile way. And this is from a book called uh, by uh, Mick Kirsten called Project to Product. So the origins of agile is in software. We talk about the agile software. Um, it is in software development. This is a terrible slide. Appreciate it. It is intended to be terrible. It's not for you to read. But the concept about it is that, you know, over uh, in 2001 and even before that, there's a lot of these software practitioners which were actually trying to figure out a way how to move away from the old management paradigm that we had, we had built from the previous, from the history, and adopt a new ways of thinking and working in software development. And they came from different frameworks, but they're all aligned to a common set of values and a common set of principles. And that's what they defined as the Agile Manifesto. And I always say to, to people um, in some of my talks, the reality is that these guys never intended this thing to scale in large corporates. They wanted to make software safe for software developers. And the principles, even though they can scale, are challenging when you're talking about a 40,000 person business or even a 1,000 person business, you know. Um, because that's the complexity that comes into the environment. So we have this kind of view, how do we scale it? We, we say that we understand the benefits that comes into software development and in IT, but the reality is we, we need to embrace this way of thinking and being in the rest of the organization. Um, so, what, so this is the new thing that's been coming out, this business agility. Sometimes these buzzwords or fads, you know, we obviously use it to our advantage, and, uh, and it seems to be the next evolution of where Agile is outside of the IT space. And we talk about business agility. And um, I'm going to introduce you to a model. Now, um, it is the first time we're actually um, introducing it to the public. Um, and it's for those that are agilists, it's not necessarily new. It's just a different way of packaging it. There's lots of agil business agility models out there, like the, the Business Agility Institute or the, the Enterprise Business Agility Framework or uh, the stuff in, in Scaled Agile Framework Safe. But we've taken some of these elements and create to try to create a simple picture. And we've used the House of Lean as our inspiration. It, we're, not, we're not attached to this. So the important thing is the concept behind it, not what it looks like. Um, so it's not the, the best slide we have, but it, but it hopefully provides the context. Um, and with the House of Lean or the House of Business Agility in, in this thing, and maybe we need to come up with a better name, is we've got the roof, which is really what we're trying to achieve, which we spoke about is the ability to adapt to change, to be relevant, sustainable, to be able to thrive on change. Um, but underpinning this is a foundation. And I think this is one of the challenges, again, that we've experienced over, over the last eight years um, in helping other organizations is the leadership. Leadership creates the foundation of the change. And obviously supporting the roof are these pillars or these walls. Um, and we talk about strategic agility, agility technical agility, and people agility. It's just a different way to, to structure what we think business agility is. I've already mentioned about the goal of business agility, but really, for me, this is about resilience. Um, we've got a, um, uh, one of the uh, other behaviors or one of the things that we talk about, IQ business, you say reimagine changes your advantage, or, or reimagine changes your growth, sorry. So how do you actually use change um, to, to thrive and to give you a competitive advantage in the way we do things. Um, I'm not looking at the questions right now in the comments. We'll, we'll obviously deal with it a little bit later. I'm just going to go through this and we'll have a, an opportunity to have the conversation. But for me, I guess, um, is the leadership and the foundation and understanding that lean, agile leadership is really fundamental. And the role of leadership is important, specifically in this very um, chaotic and um, uncertain time that we're dealing with at the moment is really about creating clear vision and direction and clarity. So if, you, if you're a leader in your organization, how do you create that space for, for your team to understand the direction in which you're going? Um, I attended actually a talk last night. There's an there's a agile conference um, that's happening in the States. And Peter Green was saying that the role of leadership or management is to create clarity, purpose, increase your competence and capability. So that's the mastery side. So how do you increase the capability? And how do we as leaders improve the system from a process, from a culture uh, perspective? And I want to reflect, and, and I'm not sure if Adam, our CEO, Adam Craker, is on the call. Um, and I know it's biannual time or appraisal time. And this is not about um, uh, 
blowing smoke. Um, it's really about being honest. Um, and Adam, I think our CEO has been really testament in creating this energy for the organization. I'm often accused of being a little bit negative, but um, watching how Adam deals with the situation has been truly inspirational. We've got this thing called the duty of care um, at our business, and it really is around the three pillars, uh, which is the IQ, the customer, and IQ business as an organization. And any decision that we make around um, COVID or, or any practices or anything that we do talks about it. So if a true consultant would have a Venn diagram, and it's the middle piece that we're talking about. Um, and that's the important thing, right? How do we create this kind of duty of care, the vision and clarity for us um, as far as it's concerned? So that's something that's important for you to adopt and thinking about what is that, what is the purpose ultimately that you're trying to achieve. It's challenged us to reinvent ourselves, to be positive about the way we come up with new um, and innovative ways to solve the complex problems. You know, we have a bench. How do we get these, these um, consultants billable? And those opportunities have transcended many individuals and, and, and teams. And to be honest, I remember the first call that we had about Cobra and that energy excitement from Adam uh, was really excellent and really the initiative has been amazing. Um, and many IQs are really proud to be part of an organization and, a, and a, an ecosystem of partners that are really trying to make a difference, um, as Maurice has indicated in the introduction. But the thing is, we, we need to create safety. Um, and I think it's quite difficult as leaders to create safety and certainty in a very, very uncertain world. So what we need to do is create the environment for them to feel safe, to create the kind of the, the, the guardrails for people to be able to make the decisions and empower them to make the decisions. Because as leaders, we can't be everywhere all the time. Um, so we need to be, be able to provide the authority for decision making to the people closest to, to the problems. And remember as a leader, or even, I mean, in any, any kind of context, your staff, your peers, your colleagues, um, your wife and your children are actually watching you and observing how you behave when under pressure. Because what they say is people, the, the true behavior comes, comes, comes out when people are under pressure. So you need to be able to lead by example, um, apply this kind of lean agile growth, growth mindset, because that's a reflection of who you are as an individual and will span post COVID. So that's leadership from the foundation. Um, as we move on, we talk about strategic agility. So now we're talking a little bit more technical. But the question I could ask you guys is, how is your three to five year strategy going? Um, and I say this tongue in cheek because we go away and we create these long term strategy. But I guess nobody could have predicted um, uh, what would happen with the pandemic. Maybe Bill Gates, uh, except for Bill Gates. But even though we, we, th we knew it could happen, I don't think any of us were prepared for it and the impact. But the challenge that we have is we need to set some course. So strategy, strategic agility is about setting that course. But instead of looking at a long-term strategy, how do we create what we call an emergent strategy? In other words, creating, setting the course for a period, but on a very frequent basis, quarterly, um, being able to inspect and adapt and determine whether your strategy is still relevant. And if you're acquired, what we say is pivot without mercy or guilt. That means if we need to come up with new ideas, new initiatives, or new things that are more valuable than what you've looked at in the past, then you should do so because we have to be agile and responsive to what is happening out in the market. And we need what we need is a culture of innovation as part of this, this is concerned. But not only now, because we need to solve these complex problems, but also post this, this period. Um, and I, and I, one of the town halls that we had, um, one of the IQs posted, why don't we, we I mean, the challenge was, People on the bench, how do we get them billable in this period of time? And the question was raised by one of the IQs, why don't we run a hackathon? I called, and then with Tepo, I called him, I said, Tepo, just do it. You don't need to, we create our own constraints. You don't need approval. Let's run it. Um, and in a very short space of time, we created what we call the innovation challenge. So a tool set around coming up with ideas to solve these complex problems. Uh, we've gone through the process of ideation, and filtering and down to five. I think we had over 270 ideas that came through. We're now down to the top five. We're going to a Dragon's Den um, kind of approach to pick the one or two and obviously run with that. And hopefully that will be something that will create more resilience. But one of the things that we speak about, and I think it's a consideration, is cost um, and cost pressure. Um, and the decisions that we make around costs and optimizing costs. And naturally, when we, we look at this kind of situation, we will reduce costs by typically retrenching our people or for lowing. I, I, I learned a new word during lockdown. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm first generation Italian, so, so English is sometimes challenging. Um, but for lowing, 
I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, but we need to look at maybe a different approach. So how do we how do we make sure that the current capacity of people are focused on the right things? And that's why we need this lean portfolio approach, where we tie in strategy to the portfolio and initiatives that we look at. And really, it's about prioritizing um, as a as a as a key consideration. Um, and we need to prioritize based on what we call an economic decision frame making framework. Um, this is from Don Reinertsen in a book called Principles of Product Development Flow. And he says, if you want to quantify one thing, quantify the cost of delay, the opportunity or risk cost of not doing something. And the reality is that, and I'll come back to this a little bit later when we talk about the virtues, but the reality is that most organizations have really good strategies and are really highly innovative. The problem that they have is the execution side of things. So how do we actually operationalize or create delivery for these ideas. Um, and that's why I believe operational agility is important. Um, and this is really about how do we take the items from the strategy and deliver value to the customer? And as I mentioned in the picture of Adam Smith and the wealth of nations, um, the biggest issue that organizations are mostly siloed in nature. And in order to deliver, they need to go through these many handoff processes between one department to another. And if you think about it, a handoff is a potential point of failure. Something can go wrong between one department to another. And that doesn't, that obviously impedes your ability to be agile, impedes your ability to deliver value to the customer. So we need to really think smartly around how we operate or organize around the value. So we cut across these silos and we create these value streams and we focus on the business outcomes, but based on a customer centric view. And when we're doing that, we start thinking about things like design thinking, lean process optimization, and agile delivery. So the actual teams delivering in an agile manager, ma manner. That's the basics of agile, like Scrum and Kanban. And if you're a small team, you operate in a small environment. And if you're in a large scaled environment, you need to adopt scaling patterns. Um, but from a kind of tip on this point of view, um, and I recommend it to everybody that's on the webinar this morning. If I can re recommend one approach, it really is about adopting a Kanban system. Um, Kanban is a philosophy approach coming from Toyota production system. Um, it is not just the boards with post-it notes, it's much deeper than that. But it really is, for me, the least invasive and um, least prescriptive approach to achieving business agility because it starts with what you do now and, and talks about continuous improvement. Um, so if you wanna, even at a team level, if you're a small organization, look up about Kanban. I don't, we don't have a lot of time to go into the detail behind it, but it really is a valuable approach to achieving uh, operational agility uh, from that point of view. We then go to technical agility. Uh, you know, we spoke about software is eating the world. Um, we talk about technical practices to enable your agility. In fact, one of the Agile Manifesto principles says technical excellence enhances your ability to be agile. Now, when I talk about this in a business agility context, I talk about excellence in general. Um, don't take shortcuts. So under pressure, what normally happens is you take some shortcuts. Um, and whilst it might look like it's working or it's valuable to the customer, you've got this underlying uh, thing that is not, not working. So when you want to scale that solution, it becomes harder to maintain and scale and all that kind of stuff and you pay for it in the future. Um, and we'd call it debt, and with debt you pay interest, so it's gonna cost you a lot, lot much, uh, much more in the future. And over here we talk about automation, automating as much automation, um, I came up with new words as well. Uh, automating as much of your manual processes as you can. But you can't automate your inefficient processes, so, so that's why kind of thinking about how do you automate, uh, make sure that you understand your processes and optimize those first and then automate. But for us, again, if you talk about small and medium, what is the biggest enabler over here, in my opinion, is the introduction of cloud um, with the constraint of kind of expensive infrastructure uh, largely out of the way. Um, organizations can actually accelerate their digital transformation at a fraction of the cost. And we've seen that many organizations, specifically in the professional services, were really able to move to remote workforce in a very short space of time. And that was primarily through kind of use of Office 365, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, G Suite, um, et cetera. And these have been a great enablers to, to maintain and even improve productivity and collaboration of remote working. I actually read an article this morning that, that some teams actually believe that their productivity has improved um, since working remotely. 
that's the technical element of it. We then move on to people agility. Um, so um, for those that are not in the agile industry, we call our people people and not resources or staff. Um, we just It's a small language thing, but maybe something that you can start thinking about. Um, we don't believe people are resources, um, but that's just, just one thing. But when it comes to people, um, specifically in this const, uh, con constraints or uh, difficult environment, is about creating an opportunity for continuous learning. Um, in challenging times, we need to provide opportunity for people to learn new skills and competencies to make them more relevant to what's going on, what we're going through. Um, and you know what? We don't need to spend fortunes in classroom-based training. Uh, we've got access to e-learning at a fraction of the cost, things like Udemy and others. And I think we can, we, we can appreciate this um, over this period of time. It's actually quite alarming that during this time, a lot of organizations have actually cut their training budgets. And I think that's obviously an easy way to cut the cost. And we realize it. And I know context matters. And I might, we might not be in the same situation in some of these other industries. Um, but it is a short-term or, fin uh, or finite view of the world. Um, and we need to empower teams because actually they're going to be able to deliver value in, in a later, later stage. But, and lastly, we need to be able to create an environment of continuous um, uh, retrospecting or, or what we call um, relentless improvement. How do we continuously improve um, what we're doing from a process? And that's probably one of the most important, but I'll touch on it a little bit later. Um, when under pressure, people and teams are getting to panic situations and never really take, take time to reflect and talk, talk about how do we improve. Um, and in an agile world, that's one of the critical success factors that we, that we think about. So that's the, the house of business agility. It might look like something else completely different, but I think conceptually it's, it's, it's common sense. Um, it is, a lot of the stuff isn't new, but it's just packaged in a different way um, in which we're trying to simplify it to our, to our customers and, uh, and our colleagues out there. The last point um, before we get into questions is like, how do we practically apply this? Um, and um, so we've come up, you know, part of this kind of during lockdown as a team, we've, we've sort of really thinking about where is the most value to provide to our customers. Um, and often agilists and in the agile industry, we've accused of being a little bit fluffy. Um, and we, we say, actually, what about, you know, let's think about Gishido. Um, and everyone's maybe on the talk going, oh, what does Gishido stand for? It sounds very like Japanese, like Kanban and Kaikaku and uh, Kaizen and all those things. So what, actually what it actually means is get shit done. So apologies for my language, but it is about focusing on the most important thing, which is about improving speed and quality of delivery. Um, and we call them virtues, not principles, because we believe they are actionable. These are things that you can actually do. Um, and, I, and we've come up with four basic ones, which sort of underpins all the values and principles from an agile environment. Um, again, first time we, we launch in these really, but the first one is about sequencing prioritizing. And we do differentiate between the two. Um, we need to order, create uh, order in order to focus on the right products and services. And this is not a one-sort prioritization. We don't do this on day one. We, it's an ongoing prioritization. It's a reflection of what is happening. So um, around adapting to change. Um, and reality is in a crisis, everything becomes a priority one, and you need to come up with an objective approach to prioritizing your work. Um, you know, this thing around urgency and importance, you can use Moscow. But really, if you apply an economic decision-making framework like the cost of delay uh, approach, I think that's a good way to help you prioritize. But remember, not everything can be done. Not all priority number one can be done, so you have to rank them and sequence them. And that's why we say do the most important one first, the one that is your highest value in the shortest space of time. You want to focus on that one. Make sure you do that. Because if you have too many things that are in progress, you'll have half-finished items that you haven't given the full value to the customer. The second one is really around visualizing and making transparent. Uh, horrible, but make it transparent. But really, is about you, can't manage, you can't manage what you can't see. Um, so work items, activities, and the people executing the work must be visualized. Um, this creates an environment of openness, trust, and collaboration. And if we make this open to teams, they will help you solve these complex problems. And it's not only your, your challenge to face. It's a really, really a powerful tool, visualization in an agile world. And you'll often find in organizations, you have these whiteboards with post-it notes um, with columns and work tasks. And a tip. Um, again, at an individual level, I mean, again, this conference in America, Jim Benson, one of the 
the founders or what they call personal Kanban is about applying this ways of working in your personal life is about visualizing the work that you've got um, the steps and the workflow that you have uh, at an individual level or even at a team level what are the natural steps and you might just simplify it and say kind of that you do work in progress and done or maybe even add a review step at the end just to make sure that you build quality in. and the intention is that you put your work items here and you visualize it because if you start seeing lots of post-it notes or stickies in one column you know you have a problem um, and you need to solve that problem and focus on prioritizing that thing through the process. We say that, you know, um, uh, the other benefit of visualizing is you can actually map your dependencies. You can visualize your dependencies. Um, in, in Scaled Agile Framework, one of the frameworks, they actually use string in between work items. Um, and it sounds rudimentary and pretty odd, but actually if you have a board with lots of string, you know you have some serious challenges because there's lots of dependencies. Again, looking for your points of failure. So the challenge that we've got is we are working remotely. Um, so the visual boards are not going to be that valuable right now, but there are many tools that are available. Things like Mural, Miro, um, even Trello boards, which are, some of them are free. Um, start using that so that you can track. And the reason why we want to do that is to the ability to, uh, sorry, my slides, um, got it, measure and monitor. Um, and the intention is about measuring the flow of work and in most, more importantly, measuring about the business outcomes of the work that you are doing. Um, so using the, the data and information, um, and Beth would be really proud of me to say that actually using you know, data-driven decision-making around making the right decisions. When you're introducing new ways of working or new processes or, or things like that, you, it provides an opportunity to improve. And you need to set those baseline metrics. Uh, as far as it's concerned and um, continuously go go and monitor those metrics to ensure that we, we introduce improvements and another tip or another practice that you can look so, uh, look at so we spoke about sequencing prioritizing visualizing make transparent around obviously your Kanban system and visualization board uh, measure and monitor there's a practice called objectives and key results um, it's made famous by Andy Grove of Intel and Google fame and um, I can't spend all the time, but what you do is you set a, you agree a set of objectives. Um, these objectives, maybe three for a period of time, but not more than the three, with a set of what we call key results. And these key results are your your what you measure. So the smart things, um, simple, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. Um, and the intention is that on a frequent basis, you go, you actually measure against those metrics and those key results. With the intention that you don't achieve 100% because if you, if you achieve 100%, it means that you haven't stretched yourself. But at the same time, you don't achieve only 50% because it means that you've um, taken on too much. So they say about 70% is the key result that you're trying to achieve for each of those objectives. And the last but not least, and probably the most important, is how do we improve and evolve? Um, make sure that we've got the slide up. Um, and... You need to seek improvements in all areas of your operations in order to thrive. Um, we say business evolution is realized through what we call small incremental improvements across individuals, teams, and company. We call it relentless improvement because we continuously need to look for opportunities to improve. Uh, the problem, again, as I mentioned, is when we're in a crisis, this is the first thing that we're fighting fires and never have time to slow down and reflect on what we need to improve. And this is probably the most important of all the virtues. We need, we need to make the time to, to improve. Otherwise, we're not going to. And the last point around this is we talk about, in Agile world, we talk about fail fast, fail forward. Um, I'm not talking about catastrophic failure, uh, but failure in a safe environment because failure actually provides the opportunity to learn from your mistakes. I'm not sure who said it, they said fail stands for first attempt in learning. And I know that um, I think one of the recent um, uh, speeches by President Ramaphosa, um, it, it left a lot of questions rather than, on, um, than the answers. Um, but in the one speech, he was reflected about the mistakes that government had made um, and he admitted to those mistakes. Um, and it takes a lot for leaders to do that. Um, specifically, I don't know how many politicians will stand up and admit to any mistakes. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Trump won't do that, but that's a, that's, that's a topic for another conversation. And I was actually quite proud of 
of, of uh, President Ramaphosa at the time um, about doing that and realizing that these, this is a new situation for all of us um, and they will be making mistakes. I guess for me what falls flat, and I think this is the important part, is what you do with those. Um, so it's not good enough that to admit your mistakes. It's about how do we find the improvements to that. Um, and, I, and I think maybe that's where we've fallen a little bit short, is how do we focus on those improvements, those activities. I mean, the education debacle is just case in point. So last point, we, we again, hopefully this, uh, we, we Google these things and we say never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, and even if it wasn't uh, Winston Churchill, it's a great quote around the context of what we're talking about. And I attended a talk where uh, the speaker, Angel Maroto, I hope I said it correctly, uh, I think he was Argentinian, was talking about how to use crisis to create a resilient business model. Uh, crisis equals re resiliency. And he, the way that he did it is to work with organizations and their leaders through a series of workshops where they create, they actually, this was pre-COVID, where would, they would actually create catastrophic scenarios. Um, things like coups, I mean, in Latin American country and things like that. And the team would work with creative and innovative ways to solve those challenges. Um, and they introduced new processes, systems, and tools that enable them to be more resilient in the future. What he was basically saying is we should be living in this constant sense of danger to avoid complacency um, and don't wait for the next crisis to hit us. Uh, but be prepared by creating your own crisis and solving those problems. We are in a crisis. We realize the pandemic has created the situation we could have never predicted. And we in this maybe not only VUCA world, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, but maybe uber VUCA. Uh, that rhymes, so I'm going to tag that as, my, uh, as a thing that I'll say, uber VUCA. The challenge is not how we take this crisis and not only survive, but thrive. Um, I, I, we don't have all the answers. We need to apply the edge of philosophy around continuous learning, inspect and adapt, retrospect, um, you know, experiment, um, learn from our mistakes in the way we do things and run our businesses. And hopefully this way we'll overcome this as well as future challenges um, and allow us to be resilient in the future. And um, yeah, that's that's really it. From that Brilliant. Uh, before you jump to questions, I just want to point out that I have um, promoted Stephen uh, that you mentioned uh, you worked with 20 also, years ago, who's also in the Stephen. industry. So he's as a panelist, so Stephen can jump in at any point. I would love. Um, and and as long as he doesn't say anything about heresy. <laughs> What's that? I said he's going to talk about heresy, which I which I'll look forward to. <laughs> okay, be interesting. So don't, don't get into too much of a debate, eh? Anyway, <laughs> there was a question that I picked up. Um, uh, do you have a... Oh, hello? <laughs> Bob, you sound like a robot again. And I'll... And I'll and, uh, is can you guys hear happening me? on your uh, oh, there we go got you uh, Maurice. Can you, you know? yeah, uh, got can you know. here's the question do you have a strategic business mo module that keeps the company one step ahead of change um so i think the reality is about as i said is about innovation um so um the opportunity to come up with ideation and the, the culture and philosophy around ideation um so there's a uh, we create, we've got a, a process around um, helping organizations go through that process of coming up with ideas, filtering those ideas, um, and uh, providing that as, a, as, a, as an input into your strategy. Uh, because strategy will take um, uh, elements from air, or the context of the environment, um, the context of the organization, as well as new and creative ways of doing things. So you need to create that opportunity and a process to help you ideate filter and pick the right ideas but again don't i, I don't think you, you don't want to get uh, too attached to the thing because what you want to do again in agile thinking is um what we call mvps or minimal viable products we we launch these ideas because we've got an hypothesis that we want to test the idea with uh, we don't know if it's going to be true or not because hypothesis is about a 50 percent chance of success or failure we launch it we get feedback from the customer very quickly or our, or our users and if it, if it doesn't work, we pivot um, to something else. Or if it does work, we persevere. So the thinking around kind of lean agile thinking, the way we innovate and, and create to align to the strategy. So yes, there's, a, there's 
I think ideation as a, as a principle needs to be taken into consideration. I'm not sure if there's, I'm not sure if we've lost Maurice. I'm back. Yeah, oh, yeah. I'm, having, I'm having terrible internet connection, so I'm back. No um, I, I lost you guys. I'm not sure where you are, but there are some more questions. Yeah. Um, to answer the previous one. Thanks for making important facts about agile methodology. How is it different than waterfall business model? Um, so that's, thanks. It's Shiloh, Shiloh, Madikani. Thanks for the question. Um, so it's it's quite a bit different. So, so the traditional ways of delivering work, project work, is what we call a phased approach. So we we understand the project or the engagement or the initiative that we need to do things. Uh, we come up with a period of time where we analyze the problems. We cr we create a a requirements document out of it. We then get that signed off. We hand that over to designers. We hand that over to the people that will do the work, and then we test it and uh, release it. So these large phases of delivery that happens what we call large batches of work, um, whereas Agile talks about an iterative and incremental approach. So we take this big thing and how do we eat an elephant? We take one bite at a time. We take parts of it. We, we prioritize that piece of work. We go through this kind of cycle of uh, uh, design build tests frequently, put iterations of one week, two weeks. Um, we provide, we, we, we see the value of it um, because they say, you know, the problem with waterfall is that people only see what they what they want people only know what they want is when they see it and that's typically too late in the process by creating an iterative incremental approach you get getting frequent feedback every week every two weeks and you can adjust and adapt based on the feedback that you're getting so i mean uh, there's a i mean we can do a whole conversation about the difference but um, fundamentally one is a phased what we call a a, a, a phased approach to delivery and um, uh, agile is more of iterative and incremental approach Right. Um, we have a question by Guy Harris. Do you suggest combining Lean, Six Sigma, and Theory of Constraints or implement separately in parallel or sequential? If sequential, what sequence? That's from Guy Harris in Cape Town. Thanks for the question. Thanks, Guy. Thanks for the question. Um, so I think the, the essence of, uh, there's always talks about uh, is Agile Lean or whatever. So um, Agile in its essence is actually Lean. Um, so the Lean thinking around eliminating waste. Six Sigma was, uh, I guess, the buzzword um, in the early 2000s around kind of process optimization, looking at time studies and things like that. I'm not a Six Sigma expert, but a lot of the thinking around Lean has been applied to Agile ways of working. All right. So I think it's, a, it's not one or the other. Um, number one, I think from a delivery point of view, agile in its nature is lean. Um, theory of constraints is, is brilliant. Um, um, there's a book by Eli Goldratt uh, called The Goal, and he talks about theory of constraints. And a lot of agilists talk about it because that's about where the bottlenecks sit. However, having said that, and I think that's part of the visibility side of things, is you need to think about optimizing your internal operational processes, your customer processes. So applying kind of Six Sigma approaches or lean thinking to that is quite important. Um, so I don't think it's, it's sequential. I think it's parallel and it's about you know, continuously improving the environment in which you're operating. Um, we, as IQ Business Approach, some, we use something called CM method, um, which is a custom experience method, which they, which, which they say is lean on or Six Sigma on steroids because it actually takes the customer perspective too. Um, so there's but the reality. Uh, I mean, just, I guess the reality is that we're all trying to solve the same thing, um, whether it's lean, whether it's agile, whether it's traditional. All we're really trying to do is build better products and services to our customer and add value to the customer. And right now, I think is the, the thinking is, is obviously agile is the right thing. Or there might be something else. Um, and I think we need to think about that. I hope I answered your question, Guy. Yeah, then there's a final question. Uh, is this a fifth industrial revolution for new ways of operating. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we've. Yeah, I don't think it's a fifth industrial revolution. Um, it's. It's so organized. So this is where we are at the moment, right? So um, organizations are adopting agile ways of working to typically at scale, probably in the last five to six years. We're dealing with the laggards because it's been around for many years. 
um, but organizations are going through digital transformation, um, which is part of, I guess, the conversation on fourth industrial revolution. Um, things like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics, they're not new technologies. Um, the fourth industrial revolution is how we apply it. And for me, and the philosophy behind it is that um, in order to solve digital transformation, you would need to adopt agile ways of working in the philosophy um, as part of it. I don't know what the fifth industrial revolution is. Um, um, I think things are changing so rapidly. I'm not sure I, I would hazard a guess. But agile mindset and principles and practices is, will give us that competitive advantage in the current revolution that we're in. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to I don't I ask the attendees, please, to post more questions. I, I don't see any further questions, but please go mad because we still have seven minutes uh, to go. Um, what I've done is I've, I've actually found an article. Um, if you can stop sharing your screen. Um, on Forbes magazine, actually dealing with this very topic, and I was hoping to be able to uh, take you through it. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, so let me share my screen here. So some interesting comments that are made. Um, you know, th there's one that's, that's quite interesting. It says, Henry Ford is purported to have said, why is it every time I ask for a pair of hands, they come with the brain attached? Unfortunately, he viewed people as interchangeable and was focused more on efficiency and less on empowerment. Agile is the opposite. It's supremely human, according to Sublet, and creates the conditions of people to bring their greatest talents and thinkings to, to complex problems. I mean, is that, 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 is that a good summation? Oh, it's amazing. So Howard Sublet is, uh, the chair, I think he's the chair of, of the Scrum user group. Um, I've attended this talk that he, that he speaks about. And that's the reality. We've... I think we've lost BS. I think we have, um, unfortunately. But I see what I've also pulled up here whilst we get in um, is there's also this contradiction that's pointed out in relation to a primary characteristic of Agile as team members were able uh, to be in close proximity with tight connections and plenty of face-to-face -face interaction. That is the Agile methodology, but now we're faced with COVID where um, the opposite uh, is true. It cannot be achieved. So, I mean, the point here that's made is whilst this may seem impossible with most people working from home, it can still be accomplished. And, and uh, have, have I got you back? No, I don't think he's back. But, I mean, I'm happy to, to, to jump in. I mean, Maurice, you know, from an agility perspective, face-to-face -face conversation yes. is something that we've been preaching uh, for a long time. And um, now we find ourselves working in this kind of remote environment. And... It's been a very interesting um, thing for the for the agile community to deal with. I think it's, uh, how to how to get the same kind of uh, interaction that you get from a face to face um, conversation in in a remote working environment. And you know what we've looked at is how to best leverage technologies to enable that. So whether it's video conferencing or um, collaborative whiteboarding tools or there, there are a lot of very, very interesting technological solutions that are coming into place to try to break down the, the, the barriers that we had before um, where the recommendation was be face to face. Um, and we're seeing a lot of, a lot of very agile teams working, working remotely, working you know, together from all around the world. Um, and it's been very interesting to see what technology is doing around breaking this down. I'm sorry, Piers, we lost you for a bit. Um, I, we so we just, have to be agile in the way, yeah, we, we had load shedding. Well, I don't know if it's load shedding, but our power went down. So the, my Wi-Fi router went down. So I quickly just connected to my hotspot on my cell phone. So apologies for that. But um, the right answer, good answer, but Bob. <laughs> yeah, and uh, I, mean, I mean, that's actually, that's actually an interesting point, is now it's, it's, it actually facilitate, facilitates and it renders it more agile from a cross-border perspective, is that what you're saying, Bob? Is that that now it's 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 actually facilitated uh, the approach as opposed to hampered it? Well, exactly. I mean, you know, you're getting teams that are able to work collectively and and, and collaboratively on a global scale, um, rather than all having to be co-located in in a single in a single room. And so, you know, as and I think that 
this crisis and, and, and the fact that we've all been pushed to work remotely is going to have really big ramifications for how we embrace technology as a, as a communication and collaboration platform. I think we're going to see some really interesting um, progress in, in technology coming out of this. Um, you know, and, and I think the, the, the quote that he has put up, you know, don't, don't waste a good crisis. I mean, I think that we, we are going to see a lot of very, very interesting stuff coming up, particularly around around technological advances in, in communication collaboration. And it's going to Absolutely. enable agility and, and, and global global working. Yeah, uh, uh, we've definitely can we've definitely observed that. I mean, the survey that we ran with the ways of working and remote working has indicated that actually people um, post us, their preference would still, over 70% of the people, um, so their preference would be that they still work remotely. And what does that actually open up is a kind of a global re, um, ability to for skills, um, you know, and even for us. Um, so think about our opportunity to add value globally as well, um, that we don't necessarily have to actually um, travel um, because we can't right now. So <laughs> definitely created new opportunities. I read a, a, an article on Bain this morning also around kind of actually studies where productivity is improved um, over this period of time. But the challenge is how to make it sustainable. Uh, great. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, uh, that concludes, unless the panelists have anything further to add. Um, that concludes today. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the guests. Thank you to the COBRA partners for making this possible. Uh, we have further webinars tomorrow uh, for the remainder of the week and the whole of next week. So please look out for those. Please go to the COBRA website, www.cobra.org.za. Um, or send Cobra an email, info at cobra.org.za. Um, somebody will get back to you straight away. And if you have any issues, if you want us uh, to consult on a pro bono basis with you or your team, if you have any questions that are industry specific uh, or specific to your business, at that Zoom, we also uh, can liaise with your staff. We can mediate arrangements with, um, with creditors as well. In fact, uh, a question was posed, posted, and that was, you know, how does one avoid business rescue? Uh, there's a simple way to avoid business rescue, and that's jump into the Cobra ecosystem. The Cobra ecosystem is designed to avoid uh, business rescue. It's, the, the idea is we, we negotiate with creditors and pull those creditors into the ecosystem themselves, and then in turn, mediate arrangements with their creditors. And it's been working. We've been keeping businesses out of rescue. So that answers that. Uh, we also have a fantastic knowledge base on the website. Check that out. Um, it's, uh, we've been told, and in fact, I think it's been confirmed, that it's the most comprehensive uh, base in the country. So, so have a look at that. So thanks to the guests. Thanks to everybody. Until tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.